Emily is going to be our wet liner. And so this is just, Joe talked to you about how this all this equipment works. Sorry. Emily, Emily, hard right, hard right, going down that fire break. Oh, I get you, I get you. All right, all right. So we're laying a we're laying a wet line with that. We're laying it off of the fire break, um, or off of our standing fuel a ways. So the way these fire breaks were prepped is that they were rough mowed uh, a couple different times. They're actually really good. And then I took the finish mower and I went right down the middle just like I showed you on screen, okay? So, but they've grown back already in the last two weeks um, since I've, I did the middle unit. So there's not much fuel out right in the middle, okay? So we're gonna do what we showed you on screen. We're gonna start with the proper technique. We're gonna start with laying that wet line and burning off of that wet line, likely it's not gonna back off of our line very good. Likely we're gonna have to step into the better fuel to get our fire to burn. But we wanna show you that progression of decision making. We're gonna test, we're gonna test it first to see if, if, if that is necessary and then we can adjust, okay? The other thing is, is it's cool enough, it's damp enough that our wet line's not really gonna dry out that much. It'll give us a lot of freedom to play with, okay? So, those of you that have weather meters, um, pull them out. I got 45 on here. Yeah, there's our temp. Go to wind. That's our wind. This is our humidity. This is actually the burn unit right here. It's a short, kind of a triangle looking piece. I didn't, I failed to mention this in the classroom, but regardless of the shape or the size of a burn unit, if possible, always try to anchor yourselves on a corner, okay? A corner is always better versus you never want to start in the middle because you don't want to have to have two lines of fire. So this way we can just control one line of fire. Um, and we'll start in the middle. Emily, I need my, I need my map. My new, my really quick. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and call, call dispatch here and uh, let them know what we're doing. And it's very, usually very short and to the point. Usually what you wanna provide them is either a crossroad or your physical address and um, they ask very little questions. The only thing they ask is is that location, and if we we'll, if I would call them back when I'm done. Most of South Dakota is on 911, and you actually can get to them through 911, but it's it's much better to track down your local dispatch number. So what I usually do is I'll call the county sheriff's office in the county that I'm in, and most of our counties are covered by a multi-county dispatch. Like for instance. We're actually, this area is kind of a, a in-between zone. It actually gets dispatched out of Watertown even though it's closer to Brookings. And so I didn't know that before I started burning out here. So I called Brookings Sheriff's Department and they called Brookings Dispatch. So then I talked to the Brookings Dispatcher and they said, you know, actually we'll have you dispatch out of Watertown. And then they, Watertown is kind of a regional hub and then they, they back notified of Brookings County. So I'm lighting off my wet line right into the fire break. But, look what I'm doing with my drip torch. I'm literally dragging it on the ground, okay? Now, I'm not trying to waste fuel. I'm going much slower than I normally would. But, what happens with people with drip torches is they hold them up in the wind. Like yesterday, we had 20 mile an hour wind. If I'm cavalier, I could easily throw fire, you know, to the other side of my fire break or the other side of my wet line, right? And so we want to keep our torches low. We want to keep them into the wind as much as possible versus with the wind so that that fire doesn't blow off my drip torch. And if I'm going to use it as a drip, um, let's say I'm doing, let's say I'm doing some other kind of interior ignition or ignition where um, I'm not too concerned about 
exactly where I am as far as an edge. Okay, then I'm not walking along and just pouring fuel like this, okay? What I'm doing at that point is I'm using it as a drip torch. So our wet line is over there, we're cool. So I'm just gonna drip. So if, I, I'm not wasting fuel. I'm just walking briskly, dripping fuel. And I can go easily a mile if I'm using this correctly, okay? I just put my drip torch out. Joe probably showed you guys this, or did he, did he light one up for you? Okay, so what's the proper way to extinguish a drip torch? Okay. What am I doing? Taking away the oxygen, right? So there is, I mean, I will admit, I have a habit of blowing out a drip torch, but I'll never blow a drip torch out into the wind. Right? I'll never put this thing, except for now, <laughs> but look at what it's blowing at my face. I, I don't want any part of that, right? So if I'm going to extinguish a drip torch, I'm going to have it downwind of me and I might give it a puff, okay? But more or less, I'd like to see you extinguish it with your gloved hand. We're holding our backfire line, right? I'm going to have Jay go ahead down the wet line. So he's dragging it right down the wet line, right? Let's say Rod sees a problem. He's going to communicate that to Jay. He'll tell Jay to hold up ignition. Watch Rod. Rod's going to just spray out that line that Jay just lit. The power he's pushing, he's pushing toward his front hand with his back hand. He's getting a lot of power on that, on that backpack spray to spray that out. Now Jay, you want to just kind of hang on that corner for a second? Go ahead and light. Take another 30, 40 yards. Just let's get some black established, okay? Rod's tool is meant for suppressing low fire. So this is a backing fire. Rod's gonna just knock down three or four feet there with a back fire. So you attack fire from the back side with the majority of the tools that we have. Let's say that this fire jumps. Rod, step in and try to attack that fire from, from your side, but don't hurt yourself. It's not fun, is it, Rod? Go ahead and get out of there. There's no way he can come and fight that fire right here. With that, even with that tool, it's just not gonna happen. Or he's not gonna be able to do it for very long. And that fire is gonna get around him on both sides, which is not good, right? Um, so these are, now Rod, show again how you can just knock down this backside. A person that's practiced, that knows what they're doing with a backpack, can put out a quarter mile of line like that. Can't do anything on the other side, but that's kind of the limitations of the tools that we have. Let's bring some fire right down our wet line. Just kind of, just grab it right there and follow, kind of follow this line here. Pretty sure this is where our wet line is, more or less. Yeah, right on the wet line here. You kind of just, just on the, on the edge of the matted down okay. stuff, okay? A little bit more. Go down. Go down to about the film crew. All right, stop. So you guys see that we got a little bit of a wind flop going on. So we started kind of with that northeast, and there's a little bit more easterly in it. So we're securing. We're securing the starting point of our fire. Now, why we did that is if that wind flops a little bit more, at least Jay's fire is going to burn into something that we already have some backing fire. We're not running a head fire at our line. So if you come and look here, so here we're starting uh, on a small scale, exactly what we were talking about in the classroom. We've got that flop zone and that stuff is just falling right into our black area. So by having our wet line out in our fire break, we've got some really just easy, easier way to burn. Now see how Ben has positioned himself? Ben is, is patrolling the back line. Ben, that wasn't probably very comfortable, was it? Ben put himself in position to still do his job without sucking smoke, without having to deal with that heat. He's gonna last a lot longer monitoring from this side of the fire. Let's say I'm the wet line machine, right? And I'm going along, I'm going along, and Rod's having a good time lighting, and all of a sudden he, he bumps into me and puts his torch out. And what if my engine stops? Or what if I can't move? 
right? At best, I hopefully have water to protect myself, but Rod's brought my fire right to me. We're not communicating very well. There should always be about a 10 yard buffer between your, your, your fire coming and your wet line source. Just gives you a little bit of opportunity in case something breaks down or whatever to say, hey, let's go ahead and put this out. And everybody can put fire out pretty well with their feet. If you do this, you just drag it into the burn unit. So now what are we doing? We're, we're creating a little bit of a head fire, just on the edge of it, Rod. Don't give it too much of a head of steam. Um, and here Rod could just drip that torch. He's pouring a lot of fuel, kind of unnecessarily. You know, we could just drip it because he's already secure. So we got it's just a little bit of technique. But now we're allowing it to burn out to the black. And we can do that. It's a little bit, it creates a little bit more risk because we got a little bit more heat and smoke coming off of that fire. Um, the other option we would have is if had, you know, we wet lined all the way around this just so we could teach well. But typically you're gonna be wet lining ahead of your ignition. So if this was the case, I might say, well, let's just move over. You know, we can probably get, cut that distance in half, you know, because we're pretty, we're pretty secure. But for the time being now, we're all gonna just move our way that way. And we're gonna let Rod light right along the, again, Rod, right along the wet line. All right. You guys are gonna get some smoke, but put that thing right on the ground. So am I, am I scared of rod dripping fire across? No, but I do want to show proper technique at all, even though we don't have anything going on here. So Rod's got that thing right in the dirt and he's just lighting right along our wet line. Anybody feel that as we're walking? We're walking all of a sudden crunch, crunch, crunch. Much drier fuel right here, right? Doesn't necessarily change how we're gonna how we're gonna burn, but it might slow us down for just a bit. Just give us a little bit of pause. Say, okay, there's a change here. Do I need to worry about it? I don't think we need to worry about it, but I can guarantee that we're gonna have a quicker backing fire through here. So if we do do that, Rod, go ahead and run your fire right to uh, here. So Rod's gonna run his fire to here. This is gonna back faster. I almost guarantee you that it's gonna come across here faster than that backs. The wind has a better chance of pushing it there. So it might, with a wind gust, it might push it down our fire line. So is our fire line adequate to handle that? The answer is probably yes. It probably is, we're kind of probably gonna be fine. But we wanna be aware of it because it's gonna take maybe a different resources or it might take us just a bit of time to slow down and just make sure that we have some backup and we have some monitoring um, going on. So Rod, let's go ahead and Keep moving right down the line. How do we know what we need for resources as far as, especially as far as people? It depends on the fuels and really the distance of soft brake. How much brakes do you have to monitor? Do you have to babysit? And how accessible are they? And how much of it can you see? And so the people number, kind of the magic prescribed fire number, usually you'll see like a minimum of six, which leads you your fire boss and enough people for two ignition crews to go separate directions if necessary, right? Seven is really nice because then you've got your fire boss, you've got your two line leaders and they each have two people, one maybe to light, uh, one maybe to run the wet line machine and then usually the line leader yourself, you're the last person in line, you're monitoring the line. The person with the greatest amount to lose is in charge because that keeps everybody else in check. So as far as personnel goes, then you add topography or nooks and crannies and corners, add people. However, when you add people, you add complexity. So as you add people, you've got to be willing to delegate some of that authority to those leaders. As far as resources then and water, um, always more is better to a point. And if you get, like we are on the verge of having too many vehicles out here because it becomes too much to manage, you know? So make sure that if you have things, those things are necessary. It's okay to have an extra thing or two. The point being that you can have too much. We're gonna head fire this thing off.
Now he may have to go back and see there's some there's some skips. Jay, is that vent open? I don't think your vent is something's not working there. All right. So Rod's kind of filling in. I, had the, I think the vent just wasn't open all long and far enough. Okay, now when they pick their torches up. So Jay, go ahead and pick it up and he'll let it drip off. Let, let it drip off. That's the other thing when you extinguish it. Let, it. let it be upright for a while so that stuff pours back in the neck so you don't have to mess with it on your fingers too much. This is a head fire now when you got that heat, right? Now imagine if this was this tall. like. That's where I was talking about those narrow fire breaks. There's no way, oh my butt's hot. Um, there's no way that you want to be that you want to be in that zone even with the head fire coming off. It's going to be quick. It's going to be a lot of heat really fast, but it's still going to be very very uncomfortable heat. It's just taking advantage of the setup of the landscape.